The Student Government Association sets its goals for next year. Good evening, it's 5.30. I'm Melissa Ross. And I'm Dustin Grove. SGA is also planning for new positions within the organization. Ball State Student Government Association will elect its president pro tem next week, and you will be the ones to vote for that candidate. The president pro tem acts as a liaison between the student senate and the executive board. SGA Vice President Megan Pickens says she's excited to see who will be elected, and she's also outlined her administration's goals for next year. Muncie and the community together. The first thing we actually already started working on was the Muncie tours in the summer during freshman orientation so that students right off the bat get the opportunity to see what's available in Muncie, um, see what's going on um, in the community so that they go out into the community. So. And Pickens knows one goal students will appreciate the most improve the academic programs here at Ball State because that's why every student is here for an education. So I think that's definitely one that's going to hopefully significantly impact every student. You've seen construction since last fall, but now it's ready to roll. Best Buy, home to digital appliances, CDs, movies, and computers, will open its doors soon. But with so many electronic stores already in Muncie, many are wondering, what makes this store the best? You can go anywhere. You probably can go to about 55 places in Muncie and buy a TV, really, if you look. But what will separate us from everybody else or any other firm will be uh, how we take care of customers. The grand opening for Best Buy is Friday, April 5th at 10 a.m., and on Saturday, Spider-Man will be there to sign autographs. Sunday, the first 500 customers will receive a free gift bag. And Alyssa will be there. She likes Spider-Man, right? Oh, yes, definitely. Absolutely. First forecast, Katie. Boy, we've been waiting for the snow all season long, and it's here in spring. It's here. What's up? It's April 4th, and it is definitely <laughs> snowing right now outside. Um, I will be back later on to tell you exactly why we're seeing snow right now. Um, and it's 36 degrees outside. It's a little chilly for April, but wow. I will be able to tell you what's coming up later okay, on. Hopefully some show. warm weather. Yeah. Hopefully. Thanks, Katie. Talk to you in a minute. How about this? Indiana now has its very own commemorative stamp. Governor O'Bannon and Congresswoman Julia Carson were at a ceremony this morning to celebrate the new stamp, which went on sale today for 34 cents. The Indiana stamp is one out of 50 new stamps to honor each state. You see it there on your screen. Indiana's stamp features a bright red covered bridge and a view of the Indianapolis skyline. O'Bannon says the design symbolizes the state's past and present. All 50 stamps in every, in every state were designed with a theme from the 1930s and 1940s. Attorneys say a woman can't blame her doctor for the birth of her healthy baby girl. The Indiana woman is suing for child rearing costs through college. She gave birth to her fifth child 17 months after a botched sterilization oper operation. But defense attorneys in the Supreme Court case say she can't blame the doctor since she decided to have the baby. Bad news from the governor's office gets even worse. Governor O'Bannon now says last month's revenue collections are lower than he originally expected. In fact, revenue from March was down $54 million. That's nearly 9% below what state officials thought we would have. This marks the third downward revision since Indiana's two-year budget was written. Still no official word yet on whether Governor O'Bannon will call for a special session. NASA is giving a Purdue University a $3 million grant for Nanotechnology Center. Nanotechnology works with single atoms and molecules to create new products and strengthen plastics and textiles to give them more strength and flexibility. Indiana Senators Evan Bayh and Dick Luger support Purdue's efforts in the science and pursue the grant. Purdue Center is scheduled to open in 2004. Well, sorry about those lighting problems. We're experiencing technical difficulties. We'll get through it, though. <laughs> well, new information today on another American Taliban fighter. Will he face charges? Find out coming up. And Space Shuttle Atlantis is delayed. The reason behind the delay? Find out when we come back. The latest in the war in the Middle East now, Israeli's military continues to push into the West Bank. Last night, Israeli forces completely took over Nablus. That leaves Hebron and Jericho as the only major West Bank cities still under Palestinian control. Today, Israeli forces completely surrounded one of Christianity's most sacred shrines, Bethlehem's Manger Square. Dozens of Palestinians have taken refuge inside the Church of the Nativity since Tuesday, and sources say food is running out. 
U.S. officials are trying to determine if a Taliban American detainee should face charges. If a, in a Pentagon briefing today, they say 22-year-old Yasser Issam Hamdi is among those currently held at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. He was captured during an uprising in Afghanistan, where American John Walker was also captured. Pentagon spokeswoman Victoria Clark tells us what the U.S. government knows. We have a detainee at Guantanamo who has indicated that his birthplace is Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He was among the people who were gathered up after the uprising at Masary Sharif. We are working with the Department of Justice to really determine all the particulars, including his citizenship. They have a birth certificate that indicate he was born in the United States. Pentagon officials say it's too soon to determine what charges, if any, Hamdi will face. Israel says it will let U.S. Middle East envoy Anthony Zinni meet with Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. Zinni is seen here meeting with Europe's Union Foreign Policy Chief. Originally, Israeli forces barred Zinni from meeting with Arafat, but Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon said he would allow the meeting to take place. Arafat, by the way, remains imprisoned in his Ramallah compound. President Bush wants to keep his trade agenda moving forward. Bush is asking for expanded trade powers and is giving the Senate until April 22nd to approve them. If granted, he could negotiate trade deals without Congress being able to amend them later. This all just weeks after he put tariffs on steel and softwood lumber imports because the U.S. felt other countries were unfairly subsidizing those industries, putting American companies at a disadvantage. A group of Afghani militants is behind bars today, arrested for plotting to overthrow the country's government. Authorities say the 300 men were followers of the former prime minister there. The Islamic group he leads allegedly had plans to explode bombs throughout Kabul and disrupt a political gathering scheduled for June. An unconfirmed report says nearly 200 of those arrests have been released. Of a teenager accused of murdering two Dartmouth College professors will make his plea to a New Hampshire judge today. Robert Tolok is expected to plead guilty. He is accused of stabbing and slashing half in Suzanne Zantop in their Hanover home last year. 17-year-old co-defendant James Parker is expected to be sentenced to 25 years in prison today. He pleaded guilty to a lesser charge. And a space shuttle fuel leak is what delayed the shuttle Atlantis to launch this morning. A NASA spokeswoman says the leak discovered today never posed any danger to astronauts or people on the ground. The shuttle will now have to be evaluated and repaired. The earliest possible launch date now set for Sunday. Atlantis will travel to the International Space Station to deliver a materials for a new space project there. Sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, snow, again, I just can't get over right. that. It is well, coming down pretty, f pretty fair out there. Yeah, there's snow out there right now, but we do have potential for severe weather coming up. This is actually the 28th anniversary of the super outbreak from 1974. Hmm. We lost 330 people dead in this because they didn't understand the difference between watches and warnings. Warnings means that it's imminent, that there's going to be severe weather. A watch just means it's possible. Hmm. And I will be back shortly with your weekend forecast. Currently around the area, we're seeing temperatures mostly in the 30s. South Bend's at 35. Muncie, we do see 36 degrees out there, so it's definitely a little colder than normal. We usually see temperatures in the 40s. Currently, it is snowing. Um, mostly cloudy skies. The sun has peeked through a couple times, even though it's still flurrying outside. Um, winds northwest at 7 miles per hour. On the satellite, you can see that there's a little bit of cloud cover in our area. That's going to be moving out, but we are still going to see plenty of clouds tomorrow. Um, it's going to be coming down from the north. We're going to see more clouds. For the radar right now, we are just seeing, um, again, just a little bit of precipitation in our area. As the weekend progresses, we're going to see a lot of precipitation come out of Texas and up into our area. We could see some severe storms come Monday. Again, here's a look at our precipitation in the area. It's just some light snow, nothing to be real concerned about. Tonight, we're going to see lows in the 20s. Um, even down in Texas, Georgia, only going like 40s, nothing very warm. Um, for tonight, again, we're going to see 26 degrees. It's going to be partly cloudy. Wind's going to be north at 8 miles per hour. Tomorrow morning, we're going to see 34 degrees in the morning. Um, partly cloudy skies, northwest wind at 10 miles per hour. Tomorrow for the highs, we are going to see some 60s to our south, but we are going to stay predominantly in the 40s. So I'm sorry, folks, no warm weather yet. 
And then for tomorrow, we are actually going to see a high of around 44 degrees. Again, mostly cloudy skies, northwest wind 8 miles per hour. For our three-day forecast, we are looking at partly sunny skies on Saturday. Sunday and Monday, we're going to see rain. And as I mentioned before, we could see the potential for severe weather on Monday, maybe even into Tuesday. So we need to keep that in mind and be safe. The 50s okay. look okay, though. The 50s look okay. Thanks. Thanks, Katie. The countdown to summer is on, and for some, that means it's time to start getting in shape for the beach. But all too often, trying to get fit too fast can have painful consequences. It's early spring in central Indiana. Time for warmer temperatures to melt away the signs of winter. Time to count down the days till summer. And for many people, time to hit the gym. Just to keep in shape and to look okay and not look like 15 pounds more than I did when I first came here. And to get in shape for summer. Doing sit-ups and stuff like that more than like running. I just do it to make myself feel better, I guess. It's true, working out just makes you feel better, burning those calories, losing that weight. But experts say be careful, too much of it could hurt. Break a lot, just gonna do it all real quick so they get real high intensity, get injured, or they don't know how to exercise. Ball State health professor Bruce Craig says knowing how to exercise is essential to a healthy workout. Then decide what it is you want to do, set some goals. For instance, if you haven't exercised in several months, start slowly. Instead of running five miles the first day, walk a few. And no matter how seasoned you are in the gym, always set a routine. Just once you get that routine down, then you can increase intensity. Ball State health officials say 40 to 50 percent of students who need physical therapy there need it because they've either over-exercised or they haven't stretched yet. So moderation there is the key. Also on the Health Watch tonight, new information on exercising while you're sick. A recent study finds working out isn't harmful to people with above-the-neck cold symptoms like a scratchy throat or a runny nose. But if you've got a below-the-neck cold, such as fever, sore muscles, or a deep cough, you should let the illness run its course before hitting the gym again. So there you go, Zach. Next time you got a head cold, you can still work out. <laughs> well, thank you, Dustin. <laughs> with, uh, with security on an all-time high, Wrigley Field is making controversial moves, and baseball collectors have a new item on the market. I'll have that and more on Sports Next. Lonnie Jones and Patrick Jackson each played in first day action of the Portsmouth Invitational Wednesday. The two BSU men's basketball players are among 64 of the nation's top seniors who are at Portsmouth trying to improve themselves for a career in professional basketball. Jones, who is playing from Freedom Automotive, started the contest and played 26 mo minutes. The seven-footer center led the team in scoring and tied a team-high honors in rebounding. Jackson played 22 minutes, scoring four points on two of four field goals, and he is playing for the Sales Systems LTD. Jones and Jackson's teams will face each other Thursday afternoon. The games will continue Friday and Saturday at Portsmouth's Invitational. Now on to the MAC. Another coach is left. Spurned by Bob Huggins and others, West Virginia hired Bowling Green's Dan Dockage as its head coach on Thursday. Dockage played at Indiana and was an assistant coach to Bob Knight for 11 years. At West, at West Virginia, he'll try to rebuild a team that set records for losses in two of the past four seasons and was racked with discipline problems. The Mountaineers were 8-20 and this season, 1-15 in the Big East. Dockage replaces Gail Catlett, who retired in February after 24 seasons with the Mountaineers. Mountaineers and a school record of 565 wins. Dockage is 89 and 57 in five seasons at Bowling Green without a trip to the NCAA tournament. The Falcons went 24 and 9 this season, which was the school's most victories in more than a half a century, and played in the NIT for the second time in three years. Now on to baseball, where new security issues facing many teams in Major League Baseball as the season begins, but as Wrigley Field, some say the new security measures and the bleachers may just serve as the way for the Tribune Company to get back at the residents of Wrigleyville. John Dempsey has more from Chicago. What they've done is they've erected a wall 
between themselves and the community. They're acting in a very childlike fashion. It's more of one of those, uh, we're taking our bat and ball and going home in the middle of the game. Wrigleyville neighbors aren't holding back their feelings about what they say is the Tribune Company's latest brushback pitch to the neighborhood. The installation of these tarps along the bleacher fences. Tarps that partially obscure the playing field from these rooftop decks across the street. Rooftop deck owner Jim Murphy of Murphy's Bleachers believes it's a silly attempt to tweak owners such as himself because the tarps don't really obscure the view that much. Right now, the, the tarps only block out maybe about 5% of uh, the view. It's, it's, it's not that great of a deal, but it's more of a symbolic uh, thing that the Cubs are doing. Many believe what is really behind this whole thing is the Cubs' plan to expand the bleachers over the sidewalks of Waveland and Sheffield Avenues. Back on March 6th, Cubs president Mark McGuire told a packed community meeting that the plan is good for the Cubs and good for the neighborhood. I think it creates a much more open feeling out there. Our architect, uh, landscape architect, and the idea of taking the inside of the park and turning it to the outside with ivy and bricks and brick sidewalk, uh, I think people are reacting uh, very positively to that. However, many neighbors strongly disagree with that statement. And with a plan, they say, would add 2,000 fans to the already congested neighborhood. That's 2,000 people. That's a 70% increase in pedestrian traffic on that corner. You have movement mayhem. And all this is going to spill out onto the residential streets that immediately surround Wrigley Field. City Hall is blocking the Cubs' plan because of neighborhood opposition, and so neighborhood activists believe this is the Tribune Company's way of responding. It seems rather childish at this point. It just goes to show that they're not communicating with the community, that they don't really don't want to. All they're concerned about is what goes on within their walls. And now they've made a point to build that wall even higher. Sorry, we're suffering technical difficulties again. The Cubs will return home to the friendly confines tomorrow afternoon to open the 88th season of baseball at Wrigley Field. Now on to an absolutely wild story. The baseball collectibles market has seen demand for game-use paraphernalia skyrocket in the past few years, with everything from jerseys to hats to even pieces of baseball bats becoming hot commodities. But now the trend has taken a new and perhaps somewhat disturbing twist. A wad of bazooka bubblegum supposedly spit out by Luis Gonzalez of the Arizona Diamondbacks during a spring training training game has been on bid on a website for a week with publicity starting to build website creator Jason Gabbert of Woodlake Minnesota is anxious to see how the bidding will go before the auction closes April 30th that's so, not gonna fly I just don't think so are they gonna start getting gum from every player well, what I'm wondering you know how baseball players like to chew are they yeah. gonna you know after they spit out the oh, chew are they gonna try oh. to start selling that too I mean what's next with the, with Thanks, the sports Zach. world no crazy wow. After the break, Katie Collins is in with a rather recap, as well as what's ahead tonight on News Center at 9.30. Also, a new type of music is taking the world by song. Find out what makes this instrument so magical when News Center returns. You know, some people play the piano, others play the trumpet. I played the trumpet. But only a few play the theremin. CNN's Jeannie Moose, or Moose rather, went to a concert where both the performer and the instrument marched to the beat of a different drummer. Take the only instrument you never touch, put it in the hands of a performance artist in drag, and you'll discover that the theremin's no drag. From Fly Me to the Moon to a Chopin Nocturne, like playing an invisible harp. It's magic. It, it is the music of the spheres, music out of the ether. Steve Martin is it's hooked. Not... He made the documentary Theremin and Electronic Odyssey. It was invented by Russian physicist Leon Theremin around 1917. The woman said to be Dr. Theremin's one-time lover became its greatest virtuoso, Clara Rockmore. Decades later, at a hip Tuesday night performance series at New York's Gershwin Hotel, the lighting wasn't the only visual treat. Armin Ra kept making costume changes. I always say the theremin is a the voice that I never had, my Callas machine. As in Maria Callas. 
the musician interacts with the theremin's electromagnetic force emanating from two antennas. So this is the volume, and what's that? This is the pitch, like... The pitch of the performance changed dramatically when a transsexual known as Amanda Lepore took the stage. A strap on her dress gave way as she performed balloon burlesque. She made a dog, then walked it. Sort of made the theremin seem quaint. That's the theme song from the old Laverne and Shirley sitcom. It's very kooky. It's kind of comical on Rye. Maybe you've noticed the theremin in old sci-fi movies. Such as The Day the Earth Stood Still. And then there was The Lost Weekend. The theremin comes in every time Ray Milan gives in to his alcoholic urges. Lately, Armin Ra has felt the urge to play the patriotic. Armin's performances are beyond. They're so spectacular. Out of this world, you could say. After only a little more than a year of practice... It's safe to say there's, you know, sort of a new queen of the theremin. Yeah. Katie? Okay, tomorrow we're going to be seeing 44 degrees for our high, mostly cloudy. For our three-day, we're going to see some sun on Saturday and rain Saturday and or Sunday and Monday. Thanks. Okay, coming up new at 9.30, we'll update you on the latest in the crisis in the Middle East. Also, I'll tell you what the Indiana company is involved in the latest space shuttle launch. And Milan Late Willie will have your wake-up weather. And that's it. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Melissa Rossame. And I'm Dustin Grove. We'll see you back here at 9.30.